Hello, Wonder Hussy here. <laughs> I'm not out in the middle of nowhere today. I'm, well, I'm just hanging out here in my office, but I thought this would be a good opportunity to tell you a story. See, it was in the news last week that Alex Trebek died. You know, Alex Trebek, he was the host of Jeopardy for, gosh, decades. And well, he was battling cancer and he, unfortunately he finally passed away from it. But, huh, well, it reminded me of an adventure I had one time that many of you probably don't know about. You see, I, Wonder Hussy, actually met Alex Trebek. And in fact, <laughs> believe it or not, I was actually a contestant on Jeopardy. Let me show you. Just in case you don't believe me, I've got the photographic evidence to prove it on my wall of shame here. <laughs> There's me with Tom Jones. There's me with Pete Rose. <laughs> and there's me with Alex Trebek. <laughs> yeah, they give all contestants on Jeopardy, win or lose, a souvenir photograph with Alex Trebek, or they used to. Uh, so yeah, man, I was on Jeopardy, and I thought it would make an interesting story to tell y'all because, well, I posted about this on Facebook the other day, and it got so many uh, likes and shares that, well, I thought I'd share it with those of you who aren't on Facebook uh, and or those of you who either can't or don't like to read. So settle back and get ready for the story of how Wonder Hussy went on Jeopardy. What it's really like to go on Jeopardy. Now for this story, we're going to travel all the way back through the mists of time to the year 2003 when I was working as a souvenir photographer at the MGM Grand uh, here in Las Vegas. Now, I was raised uh, that if I can't say anything nice, not to say anything at all. So the less I say about that job, the better. But, uh, well, let's just say that the people I worked with weren't, well, they weren't Harvard material. And <laughs> frustratingly, they assumed I was just as dumb as they were. And, well, I wanted to prove to them that I was smart. And <laughs> it seemed like for the kind of people that I worked with, being on Jeopardy would be an easy sort of shorthand way of conveying my intelligence. <laughs> so when the Jeopardy crew came to Vegas to do an audition, uh, I <laughs> went straight over there to try out. Now I'm lucky living in Vegas, a lot of these game shows will come out here and do auditions because, well, Vegas is a big tourist destination. So it's not like I have to fly places to try out for stuff. Like it all comes here. So huh, with Jeopardy, they were doing an audition at the CarMax dealership here in town uh, real early on a Thursday morning. I don't remember what day of the week it was, but Gosh, back in those days, I worked until midnight and then I would go out, you know, whatever. I didn't go to bed till three, four in the morning. Well, this day, I had to be up early because they were expecting thousands of people at this audition and I didn't want to get, you know, stuck in the back of the line, which I was anyways. I was like number 5,001 or something like that. But it was a pretty quick audition and it was just kind of like a preliminary audition, sort of to separate the wheat from the chaff, so to speak. So they just gave everybody who showed up uh, a 10 question sort of mini quiz that was fairly easy, but not super easy. And unfortunately, it's been so many years now, I don't remember uh, all the questions on the test. I just remember they were like pretty easy. I knew almost all the answers, if not all of them. Uh, one of them I remember was about Waldorf salad. It was something like, this salad consists of chopped up apples and walnuts, whatever. That kind of stuff. 10 questions. Easy peasy. Uh, I don't remember how many you had to get right out of those 10 questions, uh, but <laughs> only about 10% of the people at that first audition passed it. Uh, and then those of us who did pass got called in the following day for the real audition. Now the real audition was the real Jeopardy audition quiz. Uh, if you've ever taken that, or if you know anyone who's taken that, <sighs> it's tough, man. So we all had to go down to the, gosh, at the time it might've even still been the Maxim Hotel. Uh, West End Hotel on Flamingo and Koval, right near where Tupac Shakur was killed, incidentally. Uh, so we had to go over to that hotel the next morning and take the real Jeopardy test, which, again, it's been so many years, it was either 30 questions or 50 questions. It was a long test, and it wasn't multiple choice, and it covered the gamut of knowledge. Uh, again, I don't really remember any of the questions in particular. I do remember one of the questions being about the band Destiny's Child, and then there were some questions about the Bible, Greek mythology, you know, stuff they would ask you about on Jeopardy. I do remember there being a question about that song. I don't even know, <laughs> to this day, I don't remember if it's 
Billy Mac or Jimmy Mac, you know, Billy, Billy Mac or Jimmy Mac, when are you coming back? That song, just a broad, broad, broad spectrum of knowledge that they expect you to have if you're going on that show. And again, it wasn't multiple choice. So it was just fill in the blank. So if you didn't know, man, you were screwed. And I'll be honest, I was stumped by several questions on the test. Uh, again, sorry, it's been so many years. I guess I should have made this video 15 years ago. Should have started a YouTube channel back in the old days, but here we are. Uh, I just remember not knowing the answer to some of the questions. So I went through and I filled out as many as I could right away. I think because it was timed uh, as fast as I could. And then I went back and like tried to figure out the answers to the other ones. Anyway, time's up. <clears throat> Wait, everybody had to turn in their papers and then we all had to hang out while they scored them. And this I found a little bit fishy. They didn't tell us how many questions we had to get right on that test in order to pass, you know? And then when they gave us our tests back, maybe we didn't even get our tests back. I don't know. I just remember being very fishy because they didn't tell us what our scores were or they didn't tell us what we had to get in order to pass. They just told us like, congratulations, you passed and you're going to be considered to be on Jeopardy. And the reason why I think that's fishy is, well, if you watch Jeopardy, it's... <laughs> Well, it's pretty much of a sausage fest, especially back then. I mean, now I guess there's more women on it, but, you know, it's kind of like nerdy, geeky, guy, smart guys. So it gets kind of boring. You know, they want to they want to jazz it up by putting, well, <laughs> by putting a Vegas bimbo hussy on the show just to liven things up. So to this day, I'm not really sure if I actually pass the test, if there even was an actual metric for passing that test, or if they just let me pass because they wanted me to be on the show. You know, maybe I did well enough that they figured what was the harm. Anyway, I'm sure that's a closely guarded trade secret of the, the game show, so we'll probably never know. But so yeah, I passed the second test and now we had to do this uh, mock Jeopardy game on camera to see, you know, like some people freeze up when they're on camera. And they just wanted to see, you know, if we could be fun and personable and, you know, make for interesting TV. Now, uh, at this time, I had never been on television and I was pretty shy, but ugh. hey, I did all right. I passed their little fake Jeopardy game and, well, they told me to go home and be prepared to get a phone call uh, at some point in the future. They said it might take months, but they would eventually call me to come to Los Angeles and be on the show. So, of course, I went straight to the library on my way home and checked out a bunch of books about, well, about stuff like the Bible and Greek mythology, uh, about which I really didn't and still, unfortunately, don't know very much. You know the kind of stuff they always ask you about on Jeopardy? You know, they always ask you these freaking questions about Greek mythology and the Bible, stuff like that. And, well, potent potables is one category that I felt like I did have a pretty firm lock on, but, well... Yeah, religion and mythology, not so much. So I went to the library, checked out a bunch of books, brought them home, stacked them up on my bedside table, intending to study up before uh, going to L.A. But golly, wouldn't you know it, man, they called me like right away. I want to say it was like the very next week. So I had no time to study, man. I just had to pack my bags and haul ass to L.A. Now, interestingly slash fortunately, uh, I happened to have plans to go to LA anyways for this other project I was involved in at the time. I was kind of in this, <laughs> it's a long story, but I was kind of in this band called Dick and Jane, and we had this song called Spanky Spanky. I want to spanky spanky. I want to spanky spanky. There's actually a music video up of it, and I'll post the link up here so you can check it out for yourself if you don't believe me about that. But as luck would have it, I had to go to LA anyways to shoot uh, promotional photos for that Spanky Spanky song. So I was able to combine two trips in one, and I was also able to go stay at the house of my friend from the band, Dick and Jane, DJ Spot. So just quick backstory, Dick and Jane, it was like the books, and Spot is the dog, but in the band, Dick and Jane, DJ Spot was kind of like the MC. Uh... It was my friend Steve wearing this big furry dog costume. So good old Steve. Steve, if you're watching this, mwah. Steve picked me up at the airport and let me stay at his place and even drove me to the Jeopardy studio early the next morning uh, so that I could be on the game show. And then he was going to come pick me up after I was done. And we were going to go over to this seedy motel in North Hollywood and shoot these photos for the 
<laughs> for the Dick and Jane CD cover. <laughs> now, like I said, I hadn't really had very much time to prepare for this. Uh, certainly didn't have any time to develop a strategy or anything like that. Like, there was this website back then, and it's probably still around, that uh, was like advice for contestants on Jeopardy, like things you should study, things you should practice. And one of the things they um, recommended practicing was, like, when you go on Jeopardy, uh, you have to buzz in your answers. You know, like Alex Trebek would read the answer to the question, and then you had to buzz in if you knew the question. You know, like, this famous YouTube sensation makes her living exploring abandoned buildings in Ghost Town. You would go, what is Wonder Hussy? Huh. Okay, well, according to this website, you were supposed to practice buzzing in using a clicker pin because uh on the show when alex reads the answer you can't just buzz in right away you can't buzz in before he's done like they don't want you interrupting they try to keep things very classy and polite on jeopardy so what you have to do is you have to wait till alex trebek reads the answer and then you have to wait like one two like wait a beat before you buzz in because if you buzz in too soon you actually get locked out for like three seconds or something, which is an eternity on Jeopardy, right? So even if you know the answer before Alex Trebek is done reading the clue and you want to buzz in, you have to cool it, wait till he finishes reading the answer, one, two, then buzz in. And so this website recommended you're supposed to practice watching Jeopardy with a ballpoint pen, clicking pen, practice buzzing in. Well, I didn't have time to do any of that, man. The, in fact, the only... <laughs> well, the only strategic preparation that I had the foresight to do or the forethought to do is, well, I had to figure out what I was going to wear on the show. <laughs> you know, I'm going to be on TV my first time. Uh, but I thought, you know, rather than just look cute or, you know, make a good impression, I could actually use my outfit to psych out the competition. Because like I said, uh, it's mostly dudes on Jeopardy. I'm looking on my clothes rack here because I think I still have what I wore. Uh, it's always, you know, nerdy guys on Jeopardy. So I thought, oh, what if I wear <laughs> this little schoolgirl, plaid schoolgirl mini skirt <laughs> with black knee-high boots and a little blouse? <laughs> then I, maybe I can, well, maybe I can distract the dudes that I'm playing against and, you know, cause them to get flustered. And that'll, well, that'll allow me to take the lead. <laughs> So I wore this little pink plaid schoolgirl miniskirt with black knee-high boots and a little pink uh, kind of like tight sweater top. And, well, I figured I'd go in there and use my feminine wiles to distract the competition. But, unfortunately, that was not to be the case. Come to find out, I was competing against another woman, and I'm pretty sure she wasn't gay, and... Ken Jennings. Do you know who that is? That guy who was, I think he won more Jeopardy shows than anyone in history. Uh, his grand total of winnings, I think, was finally beat by a guy from Vegas, ironically. But uh, Ken Jennings, I think, is like one of the most winningest Jeopardy contestants of all time. He's like a friggin' machine, dude. He's this blonde-haired, blue-eyed Mormon cyborg who just has an insane knowledge base. And, well... <laughs> He was not about to be distracted by some Vegas idiot in a schoolgirl miniskirt, unfortunately. And it was funny because uh, at the time I played him, I think it was like his 14th game. Gosh, I don't know how many games he went on to play, but it was like probably like 50 or maybe even more. Well, I, I got there around game 14. And so they took all the contestants for that day because they tape multiple shows a day. Well, we were all back in the green room uh, offset. Uh, you know, where they have like snacks and coffee and stuff where you can, you know, eat and drink while you're waiting for your turn to go on the game show. They told all of us like, okay, well, this is Ken's 14th show, but don't be freaked out. You know, don't worry. Every contestant is beatable. You know, they were trying to psych us up so we didn't become disheartened that we were playing against somebody who had won 14 shows. <laughs> Little did we know he'd go on to win like 5,000 or whatever it was. <laughs> so anyway, yeah, we just had to wait around while they taped several episodes of the game show until they got to the show that we were on. Um, and I don't know how they determined the order, but I think they taped two or three four shows before it got to my turn. And so that whole time, I'm just sitting there, like they had bleachers in the audience, you could watch the other games. I'm just sitting there nervous, like real nervous. Like like I said, I'd never been on TV. I didn't have a YouTube channel. I was, believe it or not, pretty shy back in those days. And well, thankfully, I'd had the foresight, I guess, 
to prepare for this eventuality. I knew I was going to be nervous and I wanted something to sort of calm my nerves. So the night before I went on the show, after Steve picked me up at the airport, we went to a liquor store <laughs> and I got, uh, you know, those like bottled Starbucks Frappuccinos. They come in those little glass bottles and they kind of like chocolate milk, but they're like lattes or whatever. Well, I bought, I think a four pack or maybe even a six pack of those. And I dumped out the Starbucks and filled them with white Russians instead. Okay. Kahlua and milk. And well, I smuggled them on to the set that way. I mean, if I just brought a flask or a bottle of Kahlua, I'm pretty sure they would have not let me bring that in. But I had some story prepared about how, oh, well, you know, I'm addicted to Starbucks. And if I don't have my Starbucks, I just won't be able to function. Anyway, I don't even remember them checking my bag. So I had all these bottled white Russians and I was sitting in the stands watching game after game, <laughs> sipping <laughs> nervously, <laughs> getting a little buzz, <laughs> getting a little more buzz <laughs> with my potent potables <laughs> sitting there in the bleachers. Oh man. Well, finally it got to be my turn. And so me and the woman, and I don't remember her name, me and this other woman, and Ken, Ken was already up on stage anyway, so me and the other woman had to come up and take our places uh, at the podia next to Ken. And well, I'm only 5'3", and I guess them podia are built for men because I was too short and they had to bring out this little, like an apple crate or something for me to stand on just so I could see over the top. <laughs> That should have been my first inclination that things weren't going to go well. Well, that and the fact that I had a buzz going from all them potent potables. <laughs> but I mean, it was just Kahlua. Kahlua is not that strong. So it's not like I was drunk. I just, you know, well, I had enough of a buzz to not be super nervous. But I was still pretty nervous. And well, <laughs> matter of fact, to this day, 17 years later, I still haven't watched <laughs> that show. I know my mom t voted or DVR'd it or whatever people did back in 2003. So it is on a CD somewhere, I think, in my house, but I never had the guts to watch it because ugh, it would just be too embarrassing. Uh, first of all, Ken Jennings was such a beast that, you know, when, when they finally started the game, he just he cleared all the categories one after another. Ken, 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 he got every single one right. And well, some of them I actually knew the answer to. So, you know, I would, I'd try to buzz in. And of course I didn't have my timing right with that pen. Like, I don't really think you can overestimate how important timing is when you buzz in on that show. Like you have to have the timing down. And well, since Ken had been on so many shows before this one, he already had that rhythm down. So he clicked in, clicked in, clicked in, like right on time for each one. And it was, he annihilated the board, man. I think like the whole first board, he basically cleared the whole thing. And well, I'll let you in on a little secret. After a while, even if I didn't know the answer to a question, I would pretend like I was trying to click in just so it at least looked like I was smart. <laughs> and then I just wasn't very good with the clicker. <laughs> I mean, not that that probably fooled anyone, but hey, at least it made me feel better about myself. So then after the first uh, the first round, they come back and then they do the Alex goes around and chit chats with the contestants. And oh my God, let me tell you something. This was like one of the most awkward experiences in my life. Now, this was back in 03. Nowadays, whew, I can talk to anyone and I can be personable and I can come up with a quick sound bite. But yeah, I'd, I'd never been on TV before. I really didn't have any practice. So ahead of time, they ask you to fill out a card with like, five interesting facts about yourself. And then you never know, Alex will just pick one, the one that he thinks looks interesting, and he'll ask you about that. So you don't know for sure what he's gonna ask you about. And I don't really remember what all the five different things I wrote on there were. I mean, in retrospect, I could have written, I'm drunk as we speak, Alex, or I'm going to a seedy motel in North Hollywood after this to shoot, <laughs> to shoot photos for a Dick and Jane song called Spanky Spanky. I had a million interesting things I could have put down there, but the one that he asked me about was, so Sarah Jane, it says here that you like sneaking into hotel swimming pools, <laughs> which I did at the time, you know, live here in Vegas. I used to love sneaking into all the fancy hotel pools uh, using uh, old room keys or whatever. And that's what he asked me about. And gosh, I don't even remember how the conversation went, but it must have been terribly stilted and terribly awkward. And oh my God, I just really feel bad for Alex Trebek because I'm sure he had no idea what to make of me. 
But anyway, then we came around to round two, and in round two, again, I've never watched this, but my mom told me later, <laughs> uh, I did clear one category in round two. I don't remember what the category was, but apparently I got a bunch of them right, so it's not like I zeroed out, you know? I, I tried, but I mean, Ken Jennings was just so far ahead of me and the other woman contestant by the end of round two that it was like, what's the point of even doing Final Jeopardy? <laughs> I think when it came to Final Jeopardy, I was actually in second place. So I did have that going for me. So when it came to making that all-important wager for Final Jeopardy, you know, Ken Jennings was so far ahead. It was just, it would have been stupid for me to do anything other than risk it all. So I'm pretty sure I wagered everything. Uh, the category was American history. And I've always been a huge history buff, American history in particular. So I thought, yes. I actually stand a good chance at getting this right. <laughs> wah, wah, wah. <laughs> the question was something about these two famous Americans died on the same day in 1826. And one of them said about the other, his soul was winging into the heavens like a dove, something like that. I thought, oh gosh, I know this. I, I, I knew I had read a book that mentioned two famous Americans dying on the same day. It was 4th of July, 1826. I just, I don't know. You're in this friggin' studio with all these lights and this doo-doo-doo-doo, doo-doo-doo music playing. Like, it's really hard to remember stuff. So, oh man, I could see time was running out. I had to write something down. I couldn't remember who it was. So I just thought, two famous Americans, two famous Americans, 1820s, uh, Lewis and Clark. So I wrote, who, who were Lewis and Clark? Well, guess what? I was wrong. The correct answer was Thomas Jefferson and John Adams. Oh, I knew that. I'd read, a, I mean, I read a bunch of uh, biographies of Thomas Jefferson. I used to be a big Thomas Jefferson fan. Um, so I knew that. I just blanked on it. And well, unfortunately for me, I wrote down the wrong answer and got final jeopardy wrong, which means my total points went boo back down to zero. Wah, wah, wah. <laughs> but I did have some measure of consolation in the fact that Ken Jennings put the same wrong answer that I did <laughs> to the question. So <laughs> even though I lost on Jeopardy, hey, at least I got the same wrong answer as Ken friggin' Jennings. <laughs> now, meanwhile, the, the other contestant, the other woman, she actually got Final Jeopardy right, which means, well, you guessed it. Not only did I lose on Jeopardy, baby, I came in third. Like, I really lost on Jeopardy. <laughs> now, I don't know what they do now. I feel like back in the day, it was like, you know, first place you won, you got to keep your money and come back the next day. The next day, really the next show. Uh, and then second place, you used to get like a trip to Hawaii. And then third place, you get like a washer dryer. Well, they just gave me a thousand bucks consolation money, which, you know, I guess... In retrospect, getting a thousand dollars is or was more consolation than even having the same wrong answer as Ken Jennings. At least I got some money to pay for my plane ticket out there. You know what I mean? So there I was. I had my thousand dollars coming to me in the mail. Uh, it was only about halfway through the day. I don't even think it was lunchtime yet. And they still had several episodes to tape. My friend Steve wasn't supposed to come pick me up until... Uh, the late afternoon, he had something else he was doing. So I just figured, oh, okay, well, that's fine. I'll hang around on the studio lot. You know, that little cafeteria. It'll be like the old days, like those starlets having lunch in the, you know, the movie studio lot cafeteria. And then some producer spots them from across the lunchroom and goes, her, that's the one I want to star in my upcoming movie. You know, that kind of thing. I thought it'd be super fun to do, but... Well, unfortunately, nowadays, or back then anyways, man, they just, they kick you right off the lot the second they're done with you. <laughs> I mean, it was rough, man. The second I was done taping my show, it was go back to the green room, get your bags and get out. <laughs> they kicked me unceremoniously off the lot. And I still had, oh gosh, a couple few hours to wait until Steve could come pick me up. So... I think I remember going to a real Starbucks across the street and getting an actual Starbucks to sort of sober up and, well, just sort of kill the time until Steve could come pick me up, which he did eventually come get me. And we did go to that seedy motel in North Hollywood and shoot some pretty awesome photos for the Dick and Jane CD cover. 
And then we all went and had dinner after that at a diner. So, hey, it was all in a day's work. <laughs> it was a, an interesting experience. It was a somewhat embarrassing experience, but it was definitely a character building experience. And well, I got a lot done that day, you know, got to be on TV for the first time, got to make a thousand dollars and got to take that awesome Dick and Jane photo <laughs> before I flew back home to Vegas in the morning. But overall, the best thing that came out of the experience was, well, <laughs> Once I'd been on TV and seen that it wasn't really that bad, uh, it gave me the courage or the cojones, you might say, to try going on more game shows. So I've actually been on a couple other shows. I went on a couple other shows after that. And well, I'll tell you the story about those another day. But for now, that's the story of how I met Alex Trebek and what it's like to be on Jeopardy. I mean, all joking aside, Alex did strike me as a, a very kind and intelligent person. So yeah, it was really sad to hear the news that he passed away. So RIP Alex Trebek, uh, you will be missed. And hopefully, well, hopefully the person they pick to replace you will fill your shoes. I heard a rumor that it might actually be Ken Jennings that steps in to, uh, replace Alex Trebek. So, hey, who knows? If that's the case, maybe they'll consider having me back on for old time's sake. I'm not holding my breath.